Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. In a rare moment, King Herod is racked by a guilty conscience. When he hears what we heard last week, that's what the gospel is referring to, that Jesus and his apostles are all out preaching and teaching and healing, that is when Herod says to himself, John, the Baptist, whom I beheaded, has been raised. It's his guilt that tells him that. King Herod is under an impression very similar to King Jeroboam, who we heard about in our Old Testament lesson. The Jeroboam in the days of the Old Testament was one of the kings of Israel, and he believed that he had run afoul of the prophet of his day, the prophet Amos, in the same way that Herod believed that he had run afoul of John the Baptist. And like Amos before him, John the Baptist is wielding a plumb line. The plumb line is used to measure the verticality of things to make sure that your work is straight if you're a painter or a carpenter or something like that. So Herod is being measured up against the plumb line. And really it's not John's plumb line. And Jeroboam was not measured against Amos's plumb line. It's God's plumb line. It's God's measurement. It was God's standard. And that's what we hear from the Old Testament, or rather from the Gospel today. That of all of the wicked things that King Herod had done, the one thing that John the Baptist personally told Herod, that he preached to his face. You see, John the Baptist didn't punch left or punch right. He simply told the truth. And he told King Herod that it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife that he had committed adultery and taken his brother Philip's wife to be his own. So when Herod is measured up against the plumb line, it is clear that Herod is not straight, whatever else he might be. But whose line is it, anyway? Well, Amos tells us, and this is the thing that perhaps Herod did not understand, that the plumb line, well, it says in Amos, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line, in his hand. That is an image that recurs throughout the Old Testament. The prophet Isaiah says, he says that the Lord declares, and I will make justice the line and righteousness the plumb line. To the Lord is the one who always holds the plumb line. That the justice and the righteousness that are the divine standard to which we are to conform is God's himself. And it's not just the Herods and the Jeroboams of this world, but it is all people who do not measure up, who it turns out that they are crooked for all who sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that they all have been weighed in the balances and have been found wanting. John the Baptist is beheaded in prison because he measures out the plumb line of what God says is justice and righteousness. It's that plumb line that is the only reliable measure because it is God's word and God's word does not change. The Lord does not change. The word of the Lord endures forever. The platforms of political parties may change and they change in a frankly disappointing way, but the word of God does not change. You ever reckon that perhaps Somebody tried to warn John the Baptist in those days. And they said, John, 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 please don't lose your head over a social issue like marriage. Because after all, time changes everything. This is the first century, after all. And it is despite the arrogance of man that the standard of God's judgment does not change. That it belongs to the Lord. And the word that John speaks that condemns King Herod is the word of God. And at some level, King Herod knows this. There is some kind of allure to John the Baptist. Because we often think about how Herod is such a villain, which he is, because he ultimately fails. He ultimately does the wrong thing. He dies in his sins. But there is something that draws him to John. The gospel tells us that Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. And when he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, but he heard him gladly. 
How many people in your life do you gladly hear tell you off about the wrong things that you've done? And yet he had that audience with Herod, John the Baptist did. It's a really strange thing, actually, that Herod hears John gladly. Now, he didn't take the prohibition against adultery very seriously. And yet he found something compelling about what John the Baptist had to say. And it might have been that he suspected that there was something else to the man who was clothed in camel's hair, who was proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, who was claiming to prepare the way of the Lord. And it could well have been that Herod heard John gladly because he suspected that what the prophet Isaiah said was true, that the crooked shall become straight. And we could have wished that Herod would have joined the ranks of other sinners who came to their senses and who were forgiven. As you know, we had St. Peter the Apostle, who even after he denies Jesus three times at his most critical hour, Peter repents and he's restored. And you know about St. Paul, who repents and he's redeemed from his blasphemies and from his persecution of the church. And we would like to put Herod in that category as well. But Herod disregards not only John, but then he disregards the one who was to come that John prophesied about. Herod's failures are many. He is manipulated by his wife. He doesn't have any integrity to stand on in front of his friends and his birthday party guests. And then he's enticed by his stepdaughter, who would also be his niece, which is kind of gross, and her fan dance or whatever she did. He is crooked indeed. And later, Herod finally meets Jesus face to face. You have one more opportunity for the crooked to be made straight. And the evangelist, this time it's Luke, but he uses that same word. You remember that Herod gladly heard John the Baptist. St. Luke tells us when the time comes on Good Friday, Herod was very glad, for he had long desired to see Jesus because he had heard about him. But by the time that Herod finally gets to meet Jesus, their all twinge of conscience is gone. The all sense of conviction has worn off. And now that he receives Jesus as Pilate's prisoner, the only thing that occupies Herod's mind is mere idle curiosity. Because St. Luke tells us that what Herod wants now, now that Jesus doesn't look so tough and so powerful and he's beaten and bloodied, now he wants a sign. Now he wants Jesus to do a little magic trick since apparently he is the king and he's from Galilee and Herod happens to be the tetrarch of Galilee. He was so afraid of John the Baptist, he wouldn't lay a hand on him until, well, you know the thing about how hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. He wouldn't mess with John. And then when he finally sees Jesus, who is the son of God face to face, he lacks all fear, and instead the gospel tells us with his soldiers he treated Jesus with contempt and mocked him. Even though Jesus is the one who is mightier than John. Crooked Herod might have put John to death, but he did not thereby become acquitted. And it's something to keep in mind whether you curry the favor of the worldly or not, whether they hear you gladly or not, the thing that you always have to remember that the church cannot afford to forget is that when a person cannot silence the accusation of his own conscience, he will try to silence the person that afflicts it so much. And that's what we see with Herod and John the Baptist. And even though he cuts off John's head, John still speaks because the plumb line is still in the hand of the Lord. What might have happened, though, if John had actually, or if Herod had actually heard John out entirely, if he had continued to hear him gladly, if he had actually put away the wife of his adultery? This is where we learn from Herod. Do not silence your preacher. Do not quench the spirit. The psalmist says today if you hear his voice, 
do not harden your hearts. So when you have done these things, when you have sought to silence the voice of God's word because it tells you things about yourself that you don't like, then you need to repent. When you have tried foolishly and fruitlessly to halt the preparation of the way of the Lord, repent because the crooked shall become straight one way or another. And the Lord continues to measure all things, you and me, by his plumb line. And his justice and his righteousness will not change with the times. They will not change with your circumstances and they will not change because we love our lusts. The plumb line reveals that which is crooked and that which is straight. There's a remarkable thing though about the plumb line is that the plumb line does that. It shows what's straight and it shows what's crooked. But you know, in the hands of Jesus, the plumb line looks an awful lot like his cross. It is a divine instrument after all, and so it does divine and remarkable things. And when Jesus measures you by the plumb line of his cross, what we find is that righteousness and justice are not just attributes of God, and they're not just standards to which you and I cannot attain, but it turns out that the righteousness of God is his gift to you, that he gives to you and to me. And then when Jesus measures us with his plumb line, it so happens that we measure up. The crooked shall become straight. And he makes us to measure up, not by correcting our behavior. Repenting of sin and leading a different life is a part of that. But the thing that makes us righteous and holy is that, as Paul told us in Ephesians, that he gives us redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. The disciples of John bury his mangled body in a tomb. That's how the gospel ends today. Our apostles and our prophets lie slain for now, and yet they still speak, and we still speak, and God still speaks. He still holds the plumb line, and everything will be sorted out, and the crooked will become straight, including that which needs to be made straight in you. For nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. Justice and righteousness shall rule. And when Christ comes, not only does his righteousness come to light, but the righteousness that he gives to you and me comes to light as well. In Jesus' name, amen.